Hi, I make snails and today I'm going to make a snail based on a jewel beetle, which is a really cool iridescent sparkly little critter, very colorful, very cool. And I'm also going to show you some really interesting things with some kind of unique posing that I don't usually do for other snails. I'm going to be making a stand for this guy out of resin so that he can be kind of like up off of the table, actually kind of in like a flying position. Um, and also I'm going to do some interesting things with the pigmentation of this particular snail. We're going to use some really sparkly shiny different like glitter powders and stuff just to get a really colorful and uh, interesting finish as close to the actual beetle as I can reasonably get at least at this point in my knowledge of techniques and things. So um, with that said this is also going to be kind of a different and weird video. I haven't done a video this way before where I'm filming myself and kind of going through the video with you. I'm hoping it'll be a little bit more entertaining than doing my voiceover thing that I've done in the past. Um, but uh, I do apologize in advance for any technical issues that might occur because I'm still learning all of this kind of long format style editing stuff. And this is a new microphone, so I'm not sure how sensitive it's going to be if I pick up like things outside or my pets and stuff like that. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I'm going to do the best that I can to make this as professional as I can, but I am still learning a lot. Um, so with all of that said, let's just get right into the snail making. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to prep my eyes. Now I've shown this in my past videos as well, but it bears repeating or it's worth repeating words. Um, but I use these glass boiling stones. They're just glass spheres. They come in a wide variety of different uh, sizes. Super handy. I've had nothing but good luck with them. And because these uh, jewel beetles are so sparkly and iridescent, I wanted it to have sparkly and kind of iridescent eyes as well. So I'm going to do a layer of this clear acrylic paint that has some very fine glitter powder in it as well. And I'm going to let that dry. And in the meantime, I'm going to use Super Sculpey for this guy because there's a lot of parts, especially with, um, I'm going to have it posed with the wing kind of, um, it's not the wing, but like the part of the shell that covers the wing. I'm going to have those open so that you can see the wings underneath. So the Super Sculpey will be much more forgiving with, <laughs> I'm already getting behind my video with all the talking, um, with uh, giving me a little bit more wiggle room for like flexibility and durability. So I'm going to use this wooden mushroom as kind of a base uh, support for when it's in the oven. And I'm going to start with making those kind of wing cover areas. <sighs> Words. Um, so I've, <laughs> I've rolled out my clay into a sheet and then I'm going to place that over the wood. I'm not going to use anything to connect it other than just kind of a sort of vacuum seal of pushing out any air bubbles. That way it's easy for me to remove it after it's baked. So I'm going to lay that on there, get it on nice and smooth, and then I'm going to use my craft blade to kind of trim it to the approximate shape and size that I want, making sure that it uh, will wrap around the body of the snail in the way that I want. Even though these wings are going to be open, I want to do my best to make it so that it would all work if it was closed, because that's what's going to give me the most realistic result in the end. So with that in mind, I've cut the shape of it and then I'm going to start kind of further defining it. So I marked the middle of it and I'm going to use my longer craft blade to cut that so that it can be a nice straight cut very carefully, of course. These craft blades, this one in particular, isn't very sharp, but it's certainly sharp enough to cut through the clay. So, but it's always good to be careful with blades. Then I'm going to use my X-Acto knife and kind of further refine the shape and give it sort of that rounded edge towards the bottom that tapers out because um, looking at a lot of reference pictures and stuff when I do this, although I didn't show them in the video footage itself, but references are super important and definitely worth having and worth constantly referring to throughout the process. It's very easy for me to get like a mental image in mine and just like get stuck on that, even if it's inaccurate. So reference images, especially when you're doing something based on a pre-existing thing, always a great idea. So now that I've got that one side trimmed to the uh, shape that I want, I'm going to start trimming the other side and kind of flip back and forth and refer to the first side as much as I can, even though they're, you know, on opposite ends of each other, just to try and get it as symmetrical as I reasonably can. I'm sure they're not like 100% perfect, but hey, that's just being a human. <laughs> After I get that done, I'm going to use my fingers to kind of smooth down those edges because where I've used that blade, it's like a hard, I mean, more or less 90 degree angle with like a sharp corner. 
I don't know why this is a sharp corner. I'm not good with hands either. Hands and words, they're not my forte. But I'm gonna use my fingers to, well, I guess hands in skull. I'm getting distracted. Uh, I'm gonna use my fingers to smooth those edges and kind of round things out so that it's a little bit more organic um, and doesn't feel so like, you know, cut and hard. So I'm using my X-Acto knife to retrace where I already cut just to make sure that that's really deep and then it's gonna go in the oven. That's my oven screen, because you are awesome and don't ever forget it. <laughs> Moving right along, I'm gonna start working on the body of the snail while that's in the oven. And I'm going to kind of start by getting the general shape and size that I want. Here I'm marking off where I want the kind of edge of the, I guess the neck, maybe the thorax, head, thorax, abdomen, right? Where I kind of want the abdomen to start, I guess, is what I've marked here. And then I'm gonna start also kind of flattening what will be the um, abdomen. Uh, again, looking at reference images of these particular insects, so they have a kind of a more flat, kind of almost like a, I don't know, I can't think of anything to compare it to, but they've got kind of a, a flat, weird abdomen, almost like a pea pod, I guess, but symmetrical. Anyway, cutting off the excess clay and kind of starting to get the head shaped the way I want it. Um, this guy is going to be posed so that he's kind of like looking over his shoulder. That way I can have him placed in such a way where you can see the wings and the back because that's where a lot of the detail and a lot of the coloration is on these beetles. So I really wanted that to be the focal point. If I just had this guy like flat sitting on the ground like I kind of usually do my snails, you'd maybe see like one side of him and a little bit of the top of him and his head but i really wanted to make sure that you saw the full back of him and his wings and all of that so having him looked over his shoulder will make that a lot easier for me to have that be more visible even though it is a little bit of an awkward posing but you'll see when we get there it worked out pretty well i think and it's something i've done before for um like i did a death's head mock mock a death's head moth that was similarly, <laughs> this is gonna be a hot mess. That was similarly posed so that you could really see their wings because their wings and especially that marking on the back of them is like, you know, one of the most recognizable parts of a death's head moth. Moth. And, and um, I've done it with a couple other insect type things as well. Like I did a Luna moth and anything where I really want the wings to be visible. Um, it's been a really nice and useful pose to be able to do. So you'll see here I'm starting to kind of crank his little head around so that you can see him and he can see you while you're looking at him. And I did this in the way that I did of like making the mouth and everything just kind of straight on and then turning him as opposed to like trying to sculpt it already turned because I found that doing that especially with the clay being as malleable as it is at this point with me having warmed it with my hands and everything it just gives it a more kind of natural realistic look to do that and then bend it as opposed to trying to sculpt it pre-bent um, because it kind of just does a lot of the work for me. I don't have to try and worry about making it look like he's turned around. I can just literally turn him around. So here I'm kind of um, working a little bit more on the tip of his tail because they do have kind of like this little nubbin at the end of their <laughs> at the end of their little abdomens. Um, so I'm just kind of getting that shaped. A lot of sculpting is just kind of coaxing the clay into the position that I want it to be in. It can be a very gradual thing, but it can also go pretty quickly. It, it really just depends. And there's no telling until I start doing it. <laughs> so as much as I try to kind of pre-plan and estimate how much time things are gonna take, it's always variable. So for my support structures for the eye stalks and the like, I'm gonna be using this 17 gauge um, electrical fence wire. I've had this spool for years now and I still haven't gotten anywhere close to running out. I think it cost me like $20 at a, at a home improvement kind of store. Um, and it's just the right amount of bendable that makes it easy to work with, but it's not so bendable that it doesn't work well as a support structure. So it's, it's really been super handy. I went ahead and cut off about an inch, maybe three quarters of an inch for each eye stalk. And then took a longer piece and kind of spooled both ends of it to use to support the shell that I'm going to attach. Um, I chose this shell because I liked the shape and size of it. I thought it would look nice looking down at it from the back. 
um, and it wouldn't obscure the wings too much. It was something that I felt like realistically, realistically, if this were a real thing, the wings could potentially kind of close around underneath of it and like have a decent look about it, not leave any big gaps. So here you can kind of see where that piece of wire, that like anchor wire that I made is going to fit up inside of the shell. I've curved it as well to kind of fit around that main big opening portion of the shell. I'm gonna fill it with some, uh, some clay adhesive. <laughs> because um, it's very liquidy and it'll kind of run down a little bit more into the inner spiral portion of the shell and then I'm going to put some clay in on top of that as well just for extra filler and support and to create a really good anchor structure for that wire to go down into to really make sure that the shell is held onto the body really well. I could probably get away with not doing this and with just having the clay itself hold it onto the body but I'm really paranoid and really worried about if, you know, heaven forbid someone were to drop the stale that the shell wouldn't just come shooting off the back of it. I've never had that happen and I don't know if it's because I put those wires up in between the two or not. But I mean, obviously it's always best to just not drop them, but accidents happen. So the more durable and strong I can make my sculptures, the better, because I know I'm accident prone and I'm sure other people are out there and I want these snails to survive as long as I can possibly make them. So I've put a little bit of extra clay on the outside of the shell as well, just to make blending it into the body and getting it securely attached a little bit easier. And here I'm pressing it in and making sure that those wires that I left sticking out are inside of the body of the shell. And then I'm gonna use my ball tool to kind of push that clay into the clay that is making the body of the snail so that I have a nice and secure attachment between the two trying to make sure that I get any air out of there and that everything is just completely smooth and completely combined so that it will be as strong as possible. I'm gonna also then go back in with my fingers as well as my super handy dandy, here it is, silicone brush tip tipped tool. <sighs> Words, man. Um, these are super duper handy and super duper squishy. They make it really easy to get into little creases and crevices. You can find them in lots of different sizes. Here's a little tiny one, as well as different shapes, which you'll see me using at some point later in the video, a couple of other shapes. I'll show you those two when I get to them. But they're super great for smoothing things out and they don't leave behind any fingerprints or anything like that. Um, I personally am not super worried about leaving prints behind. I probably have left a fingerprint on at least every snail that I've made at some point or another, some, at some location on its little body. Um, but I don't mind it. Sometimes the texture actually really comes in handy. Um, and it's, you know, it's not anything that I find particularly distracting. So again, just making sure that it's a very well blended and kind of making sure everything stays in the positioning that I want it so that that shell is nice and securely attached. Next, I'm going back to my eyes because that glitter layer has dried and I'm gonna put a black paint layer over top of that just to be able to give that glitter a bit more contrast. And also, I personally just kind of like darker eyes on the snails. I feel like they kind of pop more. They look a little bit cuter, though I will on occasion do some different colors and things. Um, but primarily this was to help let the glitter kind of stand out because if I just left it a white background, you would have definitely still been able to see the kind of glitter effect. Um, but there's just something about glitter on top of black that just really makes it pop. So here you can see I only painted on that back half because obviously I want the front half to be clear so that you can see through into the different layers. And now I'm going to use some more of my Sculpey um, clay adhesive, polymer clay adhesive. I use a lot of Sculpey brand stuff. They don't sponsor me. It's just what I've always had more readily available to me. Um, but I like to keep some of the adhesive in this little plastic box that I um, can more easily just kind of dip the pieces into rather than trying to squeeze them out of the bottle like glue all the time. It's just so much easier and much more kind of hands-free to be able to just dip it. So here I'm making a couple of pilot holes to kind of give me an easy spot for where I'm going to put my eyes later. That way when I go to push the eye stalk that has the clay then on it, uh, the clay itself doesn't get kind of misshapen as much for me pressing on it to get it down into there. So I'm gonna just take a little tiny piece of clay, put it on top of that wire that has a very thin coating of clay adhesive on it, and then I'm gonna start tape 
uh, shaping that into kind of a taper so that it's you know thicker at one end, thinner at the other end, and I'm gonna leave a little bit of that wire then exposed at the bottom so that I can stick that down into that hole that I kind of uh, pre-made in the head of the snail. It looks like nose holes. <laughs> So I'm gonna stick that down in there and then once again I'm gonna use I think I use my ball tool man it's been so long since I did this I should have done I should have edited this so much sooner okay using my ball tool to smooth that into the clay of the body once again and then probably using my silicone tip brush tool to further like blend and just make that a really nice smooth transition the more you can kind of keep things looking nice and uh, more or less like finished as you go, the better. Um, it's always easier to kind of do that, hey, transition, <laughs> and then do the other eye. It's always easier to kind of do those little refining cleanup things as you go rather than to try to do them later. So next I'm gonna do this, um, the eyeballs. <laughs> I'm having a hard time keeping up with my own video here. I'm gonna do the eyeballs. So I take a little piece of clay that's about the same size as the boiling stone itself which here you can see I've got my little boiling stone and I'm gonna put the painted half of the eyeball into the clay and then kind of work to push the clay up around it just to really kind of hold and, and keep that eyeball in place. If I just left it kind of like half sitting in there straight, it's much more likely to pop out if something were to hit it. So by having that kind of grab around it, oh, and there you can kind of see the sparkles, sparkly eyes. But by, by having that clay kind of grab around it, it gives it a much more secure hold so that it's less likely to fall out. So I'm going to kind of pre-shape it a little bit and then I'm going to make a little impression in the bottom of that piece of clay for the same reason that I make a pilot hole in the head of the snail, just so that it's a little bit easier to attach the two and makes it less likely for me to um, kind of misshape that clay in the process of attaching it. I'm gonna blend that on as always. Um, but yes, what I was saying about kind of continually cl doing cleanup is really a huge time saver. There's been many a times when I've thought like, oh, I'll just leave that little bump and I'll just sand it off afterwards, it'll be fine. Or, or what have you with any number of other little kind of things that come up as I'm working, but it's always so much easier and so much faster if I just take the time to kind of keep things clean and tidy and nice as I'm going, rather than trying to come back to it later after I've gotten on to the next step. Um, it's, it's just so much better. And maybe that's just a me thing, <laughs> but it's definitely something that I found is absolutely necessary. And it, it's worth sharing with you guys because it might help you too. So once I've got that eye nice and attached the way I want it, I'm gonna add the other one on. Oh, transition. <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't show that whole thing. It's been so long since I've watched this, I wasn't sure if, if that was gonna be the case or not. Okay, so now I'm gonna start working on his expression. I want this little guy to be a little happy bug. So I'm gonna take a piece of clay and flatten it out into a little sort of pancake and then cut that in half. And each one of those half circles are going to become my kind of like under eye, like happy smiles. Because if there's one thing that I've learned in trying to give these super simple faced snails expression, it's that it's all in the eyes. It's really all in the eyes because there's only so much you can do with a little mouth. So a smile will go a long way, but a smize will really do it. So I'm gonna give him his under lids and blend those in and shape those. Once again, a lot of blending, a lot of shaping, a lot of coaxing, a lot of refining, a lot of smoothing. It gets pretty repetitive. Let me know in the comments if you think that I should continue doing videos like this where I go fully through step by step in detail or if you guys are getting tired of, I mean, I know this is only my third video, but if, if you feel like it's not necessary to keep repeating these things, maybe you want videos that are shorter, maybe you want videos that just focus on a certain aspect, or maybe you want things that are, you know, to, that continue to be this in depth. Oh my gosh, I hit the camera. Excuse me. Why didn't I edit that out? Giving him his little smile pushing his kind of upper lip down and then the silicone brush tip tools are super handy for getting just a nice smooth little, you know, right in the corners of his little cheeks. Look how happy he is. 
Okay, so since he's gonna be posed flying, I'm gonna use this glass ball from a snow globe as his support, kind of like I did with that wooden mushroom in the beginning to make the wings, which we'll come back to here in just a second. I'm gonna use this glass uh, globe to support him so that he has the sort of posing and shape that I want him to have. I can't get over its face. It's been a while since I've seen his cute little face. It's cute. <laughs> Uh, the glass is totally safe to go in the oven to bake long, just, just like the wood I should have mentioned. You're awesome! Um, but yes, they both do just fine in the oven. This polymer clay bakes at a pretty low temperature of like 250 to 275-ish, depending on the brand you're using and what you're doing. Um, but and then you'll see here, since I didn't put any clay adhesive or anything, those pieces just pop right off. So now at this point, he is baked as well as these wing pieces. And you can see here, I'm kind of testing the fit, trying to figure out exactly how I want them placed. And then I'm gonna take a pencil and kind of mark where I'm going to drill my pilot holes because he's now stiff from being baked in the oven. And I'm gonna use my same wire that I use for everything else to create the support system for these wings and to attach these wings. So I'm going, oh, I didn't like where this one was, so I'm gonna move it. You can very easily erase and it's just fine. No worries. Erasers are so great. I'm going to use the same wire <laughs> and I'm gonna make kind of an L shape that goes along the back of the wing. I'm gonna just cover, call it the wings, even though I know it's not the wings. It's part of the shell that's the cover for the wings, but it's just easier to say wings. I'm sorry. But I'm gonna put that along the back and then have a little bit coming off the front that's gonna go down into the body of the snail to create kind of like a, an anchor point. Um, and looking back with hindsight, I maybe should have done this a little bit differently, although I, I know there's steps that I take going further from this, going forward from this that make it so that it's perfectly fine and structurally sound and everything. But if I wanted to just kind of take it to the next level, um, so the, the shape of that wing and then having the wire underneath it, I wanna make sure that I leave a, a pretty long piece underneath there to support the wire because if I did just a short piece, it would be much more likely to get broken off. So having the wire kind of run almost the full length of that shell wing, um, will really help to make sure that that's pretty stable. Um, if I did want to kind of take this to the next level, I could have sanded that piece of wire. I also could have maybe given it kind of some sort of a shape so that it would be less likely to kind of turn and rotate um, on there because it's just the smooth cylindrical wire. So it is prone to potentially getting broken loose and having some wiggle to it. But again, with the steps that I took after this, I know that it'll be nice and firmly secure, so I'm not worried about it. It's just my anxiety brain talking. <laughs> so I put some clay adhesive and then a piece of clay over top of that that I'm then using to blend and encase that wire into the back of the wing. This will kind of thicken the wing, make sure that that's really nicely attached, and also give me a, you know, a, a good way to attach this to the body. So I use that ball tool and then my fingers again. My fingers, honestly, the, the two tools that I use the most are my fingers and that silicone tipped brush tool. Like those, those are the, the VIPs, the VIPs, MVPs. That's the one. I'm gonna use this hand drill to make the holes in the body. Because like I said, this guy's baked, he's solid, he's hard, he's not going anywhere. And this thing is super handy for this kind of stuff. I use it all the time when I need to attach things that I feel like would benefit from a wire support system after um, you know, a clay piece has been baked. So I drilled a little hole, I checked, and um, this wire actually ended up being a little bit too long, so I'm gonna trim it again and then make sure that it fits kind of how I want it before I start cementing anything in place. Now that kind of curved part of the wire that's still exposed there is gonna get covered because in attaching it to the body, I'm gonna to have to add more clay to it and that's gonna kind of lengthen the look of that piece as well and cover up that wire. Excuse my nose, it's allergy season. <laughs> I've been trying so hard not to like snort and cough and make nasty noises, but it is allergy season, so I'm sorry. God, I hope this mic isn't super sensitive. <laughs> okay, so I'm getting out the black clay because I want to have a really strong contrast, much like I did with the eyes, 
with the kind of iridescent coloration that I'm going to put on this body. So what I have here currently is kind of more of like the understructure of his body, except for his head, I guess. Um, but I'm going to use, once again, my clay adhesive. I'm going to make sure that I put a nice, thick, heavy layer on the entirety of the segment of his kind of abdomen where I'm going to be putting this black clay. And I'm going to have to be very careful to make sure that I don't leave any air pockets in between these two layers of clay. So when I have the body, put the stuff, put the layer on top. If there's any air trapped anywhere in there, even a small little air bubble, it will expand in the oven. It could crack, it could cause peeling, it could cause all sorts of issues. So I have to be very careful to make sure that once I put this clay on here, that I then go through the entire thing kind of like applying you know, a window decal or something and just really squeeze out all of the air from the center out to the sides so that there is no air in between there. Any excess uh, clay adhesive that oozes out of the edges, I can easily clean off with my tools or my finger or a Q-tip or, or whatever. I can easily clean that off, but it is important to clean that off because if I left it, it would be visible in the oven or you know, after it's baked in the oven. The clay adhesive, for the most part, it does bake clear, um, as opposed to, you know, like a liquid clay or something like that, that would bake more opaque. However, in areas where it's very thick, it does have kind of a white cloudy tinge to it. So it, it, it is pretty visible if you leave a bunch of goo sticking out the sides. It's kind of similar to Elmer's glue, the way that it looks and the way that it kind of bakes in the oven. Um, so again, just really going through, cleaning up my edges, making sure everything's nice and smooth, making sure that I get all of that excess adhesive off, and making sure that, um, you know, it's just as clean and nice as possible as I go through each one of these stages. Oh yes, I don't use the other end of my um, silicone sculpting to it tool as often <laughs> as I maybe should, um, but this particular tool, so I use, I use this end a lot, this kind of tapered conical cone sort of shaped end, but the other side of this particular one is also kind of like a wedge shape, which is super handy, especially for getting down in those little creases like I did around the edge of the shell. Um, I have another tool as well somewhere that I need to find because I'm going to use it here in a minute uh, and I want to be able to show you guys that one as well even though who knows if you can even see it when I show it to you on this because I haven't done this yet so we'll see in editing <laughs> if not I'm sorry hopefully you can see it in the big video but again really refining really making sure everything's smoothed and you can see there for like a quick second I uh, smoothed it to where it was a little bit too thin in one spot and you could see the super sculpy underneath to just smush the clay back in place to cover that up. It's super easy as long as you catch it early. If I didn't see that and I didn't, you know, mess with it again until after it was baked, that would be a problem. That would be much harder to cover, but, but you could cover it. You just have to put more clay adhesive and a little bit of clay. Or if it's a really small spot like that, sometimes I'll just mix the clay with the clay adhesive until it's like a really gooey and then cover it up. And that works just fine too. There's almost always, I should like knock on wood or something. I've never had an issue arise that I couldn't find a way to fix, but sometimes it is a huge pain to fix, so. But don't give up on something just because there's some minor imperfection or something that you missed or something that goes wrong, unless it's a catastrophic failure. But, you know, that's pretty rare. So I made sure to fold those edges in kind of around the body of the snail with that silicone tipped tool again And then I took my blade and cut the edge of that off just to get all the excess off And now I'm gonna go around and make sure that that is really tucked in and blended around the body um, I'm not gonna get it like a hundred percent around because obviously it's sitting on top of the Glass, but as much as I can kind of smooth that and get that nice and you know nice gradual smooth transition between the two places the, the better um, since this is on the underside, there are some things that I'm going to do to the bottom of it once it does eventually come off of the, the glass globe um, that will kind of clean that up further. But for now, I'm just kind of, again, keeping it as clean and tidy and nice as I possibly can. Once I have all of this done, I'm going to start mapping out my segments of the abdomen because I do have kind of a segmented abdomen, these um, jewel beetles. 
And for that, I'm going to use my needle tool. Why do I, why are like all my tools not where they're supposed to be? Okay. Um, oh, there it is. This needle tool, which I have since, been, <laughs> this was so long ago, that I've since bent the end of um, just to be super duper handy because I found that this actually gets into things really well also uh, for blending even little tinier crevices. Um, but for this guy, I'm just using it to kind of start mapping out and marking where I'm going to have those different segments of the abdomen be. Uh, I'm going to do this up the whole body or the whole abdomen um, before I go in and start kind of further sculpting and defining because I want to make sure that I get my segments kind of mapped out and the thickness and the amount of spread in between each segment that I want before I go in and spend the time um, really defining and really making those look the way that I want them to. It's a lot easier to kind of smudge over with my thumb if I put one of these segments in the wrong place or I don't have things aligned just right, especially once it gets up to around the shell where I have to kind of make sure that it, it goes around either side of the body um, evenly uh, rather than fully sculpting a segment at a time and then if I mess up I have to completely cover that up and go back and you know redo that segment and potentially any segments above it as well so the more I can kind of sketch things out almost um, the more I can avoid issues going forward it's just all the same thing it's all the same thing just keep it nice keep it clean as you're going do a little bit at a time kind of coax the clay into the position and the you know the shape and the look and everything that you want rather than trying to like full bore just like go right into it i see people who paint paintings and and do that exact kind of thing where they'll like fully flesh out and paint like a chunk of the canvas at a time and I've just never been that kind of person. I have to I have to start vague and then gradually work myself to be more and more specific. Maybe that's just me. I mean, hey, do whatever works for you. If, if you're making stuff and sculpting stuff and you're using any of my advice for some reason, <laughs> then do whatever works for you in the end. This is just what works for me. Oh, so now I'm using this, <laughs> this other silicone tipped tool that has more of a wedge shape to it. And again, super bendy, super handy dandy. And I'm using that to kind of create a hard edge and kind of a, a slope in between each of the segments, just so that it looks more like those segments are actually kind of layered on top of each other, like a real bug, rather than being all one piece, which they technically are in this case. So now that, now that I've got those how I want, it's time to work on the coloration, which is the fun part, because I'm going to use these super fine glitter powders, and I'm going to have to edit my actual video in this part because I know that I did not edit this down, and it's super long, and it's just me showing you all of the different colors that I have, and you don't really need to see them all. Just know that they're super fine pigment powders um, that I'm going to be applying onto this unbaked raw clay. I'm going to skip this ahead. There's technically a few different ways that you could apply these, these powdery pigments like the pastel. So typically I use one of these makeup brushes when I'm doing like pastel powder or something for coloration. I could use that, but it is going to leave a slight texture behind, which I'm trying to avoid because these guys are really smooth. Um, I could also use a Q-tip, which is what I typically use for these. Um, however, I do have another thing that I can use in this particular instance that I don't normally use. Um, but the Q-tips can potentially be difficult as well because if it's not a high quality Q-tip, they can leave behind a lot of little fibers. So keep that in mind. Maybe test your Q-tips before you go full bore into it. This is what I'm going to use. This came with some uh, pigment powders that I bought. It's not something I usually have on hand or utilize. Um, they're disposable. They're probably not good for the environment, um, but I had them, so I figured why not use them. It's just like a little makeup sponge on either end of a plastic stick. You could definitely take the sponges off, wash them and reuse them. It is definitely a bit of a hassle, but it's doable. So if you want to, you know, you want to be a little conscientious and clean up after yourself, you can do that. Um, so here's the, the main colors that I'm going to be using for the abdomen. You see, we've got kind of this like yellowish green hollow powder and then some kind of purples. 
the particular reference that I was looking at, that was the primary coloration of the abdomen. So here's my yellow powder that I'm gonna use. This is like a chameleon uh, glitter where it kind of looks different in different lights. And it looks very yellow here, but when I apply it onto the black, it actually looked a little bit more green than I was expecting. Still looked really cool. It was not what I was expecting, but I just kind of rolled with it. So I'm gonna just kind of rub this into the surface of the raw clay. Um, the texture, I'm gonna sneeze here in just a second, and I'm so sorry. Oh, allergies. The, te the texture of these makeup sponges, oh my god. I'm gonna have to mute this. <laughs> the texture of these makeup sponges is really smooth, so it doesn't leave behind any texture or anything like that. Uh, maybe I won't sneeze. Oh my gosh, maybe I'm lucky. Don't sneeze. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> it won't leave any texture behind on the surface of the clay like that makeup brush would. Um, and then I'm gonna just use the opposite side of the same little sponge to then do the next color. And you'll see here that I've kind of brought that original yellow color up a little bit into the next segment as well. And that's just going to give me a much smoother kind of gradation between the two colors as I blend them together. I'm gonna rub that into the surface of the clay pretty firmly, but not so firm that I'm like misshaping and changing, you know, the the way that the clay is shaped. That's just saying the same thing twice. Um, but, but, and making sure that those two colors are kind of brought into each other as much as possible because I do want a really smooth gradation that kind of travels across the segments rather than having them be hard one color into the next. Um, I'm bringing this color kind of up into the center of the abdomen as well, just because the, again, the reference image that I was looking at, that's kind of how the coloration was. And then I can flip over and use the other end of the same tool to then do the next color and so forth and so on to bring things up. You do want to make sure that you use a little bit of pressure when you are applying these because you want it to be not just sitting on the surface of the clay, but you want it to be really firmly in there as well as really um, kind of densely in there so that you don't get little holes and things. You don't, you don't want this powder to be flaking off after the fact. It'll do just fine in the oven. I've never had any issues with any of the powder pigments that I've used, except for maybe some of the pastels that are like lighter colors. If you leave them in there for too long, they might, you know, lighten up a little bit, like really light yellows and stuff. Um, but definitely with any glitter um, pigment that is really fine and powdery, I've never had any sort of issue with in the oven. Um, making sure that I get up around the edges of the abdomen as well. You really want to make sure you don't miss any spots. Um, there are certainly ways that you can go back and add later if you do miss a spot or if something is forgotten or flakes off or whatever else. But as always, it's so much easier if you just catch it early. I love, I, I love all of the colors on this snail so much. So many fun colors and just, I never get tired of the like metallic shine. Oh, it's so nice. And the way that it just like sticks to the surface of the clay is so satisfying. Like it, it's not as satisfying to look at it and just watch it, but to do it because it just like sticks right to it. It's so nice. There's something so fun about it. It's like watching people get their nails done with the, it's just something about the, the hollow like glitter powder stuff. There's something magical about it. I don't know, but I like it. Again, I haven't watched or really touched this video in like months, so. I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants a lot here. <laughs> I don't I don't quite know what the next step was. Um, I probably am going to bake this after I make sure that everything is nice and smooth. You can kind of even use the glitter powder as a smoothening agent, um, if that makes sense, because it because it glides around so much and because it kind of I don't know, just because of the nature of it, it's almost like a lubricant in between the sponge and the clay that allows you to kind of extra like buff and smooth the clay out. Like as much as I'm trying not to kind of change the shape of things as I'm doing this, I am also kind of using it to like buff out my fingerprints and like smooth things out. Like obviously there's still some warbliness to it because it's, it's, you know, you're only getting so smooth. Hey, I baked it and you're awesome. <laughs> But, but it is useful for that as well. Okay, so after that has baked in the oven, I'm going to, or maybe while it's baked in the oven, I'm gonna do the same thing with the wing. 
cover part of the shell. I'm gonna completely coat the whole thing in clay adhesive. And again, being very careful to avoid air bubbles, I'm going to just wrap the whole thing. You'll see I'm cutting here a really straight line down the center. And I'm gonna do that the same where they kind of don't overlap so that I can have a nicer seam. And I'm gonna make sure that that's on the underside so that it's easier to hide. I'm gonna make sure that everything is very well blended and smoothed onto the surface of the underlying clay. And once everything is nice and how I want it, I'm going to, I'm pretty sure I took my wire brush tool, which is this. This is a wire brush sculpting or scoring tool. Man, it does not wanna focus. Um, it just has these really thin, tiny little wires up at the top of it here that you can bend and kind of have them stretched out or as like as far apart or as close together as you want them to be for different um, effects because it does do different things depending on how you have it um, and I use this a lot for making like moss it's super great to like stipple with to make like a little holy kind of texture um, but it is also very good to use almost like a paintbrush to make streaks or kind of more of like a um like a more i don't know just a streaky texture so i baked him and then i had to redrill my holes through the black clay because i was a goober and i covered them up and you'll see where some of the clay is kind of broken off right around where i did that hole some of the black clay kind of broke off from around the um super sculpy that's underneath, which is fine. It's all gonna get covered, but I'm gonna put a generous helping of clay adhesive here because I'm not only going to be sticking those wires down in, and so I want as much of that clay adhesive down in those holes as possible, but I'm also then gonna be putting clay on the outside as well. So I want that to have a good sticky surface to grab onto as well so that those are really well anchored in and become just a part of the whole thing. So I'm gonna put a little bit of extra clay on the end of the wire, which I'm certain I also put some clay adhesive on. And then I'm gonna shove that down into that hole, hoping that as much of that clay adhesive and as much of that clay that I've put around it gets shoved down into there as possible. Now at this point, that black clay that is around the wing structure is also still soft. Um, so that makes it a little bit easier to make sure that everything blends together and adheres well when it comes to this where I'm sticking it up underneath to fill in that gap there between the body and the wing cov uh, cover thing. I'm, I'm going to struggle with that the whole time. Um, and, and then I'm going to use my ball tool to reach up in there and kind of blend those two together. This is going to support the wing so that it's up and kind of posed the way that I want it as well as make sure that it's joined to the body really well, as well as kind of make for a smoother transition between the body and the wing. Um, so this is definitely an important step to make sure that I do. I'm gonna make sure that it's blended and uh, positioned where I want underneath, but then I'm also gonna do it on the top side as well um, to make sure that, um, like I mentioned earlier, that the shape of the wing cover is kind of extended up and onto the body to cover the wire and to cover that joining place and also just to look more natural because um, these wings on an actual jewel beetle do have a little bit more length to them than I left for this. Maybe I should have mentioned that at the top. I didn't think about it. Um, <laughs> but just to extend and kind of add on to what I have there of the wing to make it more of the full size and the full shape and cover the full area that I need it to. This is, this is like a common process of events for me. Ball tool, fingers, silicone tool. That's like, that's like the holy trinity right there. The holy trinity of blending. Ball tool, fingers, silicone tool. From like general to specific, from vague to like more detailed. Same thing under here and now to bake these, I am putting a chunk of clay underneath to hold the wing up just as kind of an extra prop so that it doesn't sag or sink in the oven. Um, I'm not putting any clay adhesive between that joint. That will allow me to more easily pop that piece of clay off. Oh, here's the fan brush. I love this thing. It's super handy. Mine, I'm going to have to replace mine soon because after so much wear and so much of me bending the wires and rebending the wires, some of the little wires come loose and come out on occasion, which is just part of, you know, part of the wear and tear 
and eventually it will need to be replaced but um, yeah he's, he's still hanging on pretty good so here I'm, ma I'm making that texture on the wings because they do have kind of like a streaky sort of texture in the back of their I don't want to call it the wings but I just don't know what else to, it's too wordy to say wing cover part I don't know <laughs> And then I'm going to put almost like a little collar of clay around him at the top of his wings as well because they do have kind of a, a segmentation between where their kind of head and their thorax um, is. So this is almost like my, my thorax, I guess. I don't know. But I'm going to put this at the top of the wings and kind of wrap it around as well. Um, again, joining it with the clay adhesive um, just to make it more realistic and more true to the anatomy of a jewel beetle but also to help with that kind of joining place of the wings and just make that all a bit smoother constantly refining and trying to get these wings to the shape that i want you can see there's a slight little warble there on the on the edge but you know i got it as good as i could get it i was happy with it and we continued on i am always trying to get things as nice and neat and tidy as i possibly can if you haven't already figured that out uh, but there are times when I just kind of have to accept that like, okay, I'm only human. I can only get this so smooth. I can only get this so straight. I can only get this so perfect because that's just the nature of hand making, hand sculpting something. So here I'm doing the same thing, applying the colors now to the wings. God, I love these colors. This gradation is so beautiful. It's so pretty. These, these beetles are so gorgeous. And you'll see I smooth too much with the makeup blender and kind of lose some of that streaky texture that I put on there with the with the wire brush but I can easily just go back on there with the wire brush over top of the pigment and add more of that texture don't want to go too crazy with it because you could certainly mess up the pigmentation but it's okay to go back and do that sometimes I'm going to use my UV resin. This is Mr. Resin brand UV resin. This is what I've had the most luck with. It has good durability, good, um, good cure time, all that stuff. And then I have these little plastic um, wings that I think I got at, I don't know, some craft store. It came in a pack of like many different kinds of plastic wings. I've used these many times for different um, things but I use them I'm not going to use that wing itself I'm going to use that wing as kind of a template almost and I'm going to use my UV resin on a toothpick and one by one I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to, oh man I'm realizing how tedious this is one by one I'm going to go through and put resin in each of the segments of that wing because this is the wing that I had that was the most similar to the type of wings that these jewel beetles have um, and I'm going to ultimately have the whole thing be made of resin, but the way that I found to do this that looks the best, and it is incredibly tedious, is to just do a segment of the wing at a time, blast it under the UV light so that it's cured, at least mostly, and then make the next segment, and then blast that under the UV light so that it's cured. If I did each of these little segments all at once and then did them, they would stick together, they would run together, and you wouldn't get those kind of valleys and, and, and hills in between. So now I'm taking that same UV resin that I've mixed with a little bit of UV resin, like alcohol ink sort of pigment in a dark brown color, and I'm going over that whole thing to kind of sink into those little valleys and create the um, just a little bit more contrast and variation so that you can see the veins a little bit more. I do ultimately uh, paint the veins on as well, but at this point, since everything is adhered and I've filled in those valley kind of cracks as well, I can now peel that off from that plastic like template that I was using. It's a little bit tricky. Once you get an air pocket started though, it just, it pops right off pretty easy. There we go. There we go. <laughs> and then I have, for the most part, my wing it's a little messy don't worry we'll clean it up but yeah that's that's the basics of how i do it so um and i've made wings lots of different ways this is just my kind of most recent iteration for how i've started doing it and again it depends on the type of wing obviously for like a butterfly wing or something i'm not going to do it the same way but i do think it works really well for this kind of like webby wing so now i have this really thin nail painting brush nail detail painting brushes have been like by far the best small paint brushes that i've been able to find um 
I used to just Frankenstein and chop up bigger paintbrushes um, until there were only a few little hairs left. And that totally works and I still do that from time to time. Um, so if you don't have a nail painting brush or whatever you want to, you know, go the quick and easy way, that's definitely a good way to do it. Um, but I'm just going to use that to paint my uh, veins on this wing. And so here you can see the difference before and after of how it looks with the veins painted as opposed to when I haven't done that yet. So I'm going to paint the veins on both wings and then I'm going to take more of my UV resin to go over that once it's fully dried to seal that paint in between the layers of the UV resin. This will again just kind of like encapsulate that paint so that it's not going to rub off or flake off or anything like that as well as give a nice shiny um, finish to the whole thing. And now I'm going to start working on the head of the snail. So in order to um, get a similar finish, because I don't want to coat the head of the snail in black clay the way that I've done for the body and the wings and stuff, just because it would be really hard to do that and not majorly distort the proportions of the head because it's going to be such a thick layer and I've already got the eyes and everything. So I'm going to just use this acrylic paint that I have that has kind of a metallic shiny finish and I'm going to mix some of those powder pigments that I used before into that paint as well just to give it a little extra sparkle and to allow me a little bit more um, free reign with the variations of color and stuff because I only I don't have like a full rainbow array of of sparkly paints. Maybe I should. Maybe I should do that. Maybe that's worth doing. But I can also add those same powder glitter pigments to the paint um, to kind of alter their coloration as well. And here I'm using a sponge, just a small sponge that I cut off um, that I am going to kind of daub to make those gradations a little bit smoother. Um, you can certainly just use a paintbrush to blend the colors together, but I personally um, have a hard time avoiding a lot of streaks in my paint when I blend it with a paintbrush. So whenever I can, um, I like to use these little sponges just because it's a little bit easier to get a smooth blend. And I do kind of like the like stippled texture that they leave behind. I don't know, I thought it was kind of nice. I'm gonna use some more of that same paint to kind of go around and do a few little detail areas like around the edges, just to really kind of make sure that I'm sticking as close to my reference images as I can and just to kind of get in as many different color variations make sure that I've covered my edges so here I'm actually coloring in with this with a color that was mixed from the same powder pigment so that I can go through and fix those areas where I didn't get full coverage with my um, powder pigment when I applied it before didn't show painting the shell whatever I painted the shell <laughs> with black acrylic paint um, and then I did powder pigment paint up around that and now I'm painting some little streaks down the shell just because I thought that added a little bit more um, I don't know a little bit more of an interesting element to the shell to have these kind of stripes going up it as opposed to it just being a flat gradation because so much of this snail is very nice very lovely flat gradations um, but I don't know I just thought the stripes looked nice so going back to our wings, <laughs> I guess now, while the paint dries, um, I'm going to trim up the edges of these wings. You can see how there's quite a bit of overhang around the edge. And I'm going to very carefully, very carefully, very carefully, with adult supervision, <laughs> use my craft blade to um, trim those edges. YouTube might get mad at me for showing this. I don't know. YouTube probably doesn't care about me because I'm such a small person on here but uh but yeah so I'm just gonna very carefully go through and clean up those edges you could certainly also use like a dremel or something like that to do this as well um but that does tend to leave a little bit of a kind of a scuff mark sort of thing around the edge that you would then have to clean up with like another layer of uv resin or something like that um which I'm probably gonna do anyway here it looks like so after I've cleaned up those edges I'm I'm going to use this clip to hold this in an upright position so that I can paint the UV resin on it again. Okay, so yeah, sure, you could use it. You could use a Dremel because I was thinking as I was saying that, like, I mean, cutting it's going to do the same thing. Whenever you cut um, resin, it's not going to have that same super shiny, glossy finish to it because you're cutting, you know, into the surface of that and it's not going to be a perfectly smooth unless you're using something hot maybe, but that, that would be bad. Bad fumes. Don't do that. Um, 
<laughs> but, but it's going to kind of scuff the surface. So to then kind of make sure everything is nice and smooth and rounded and glossy, I usually do apply another layer of UV resin. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to do it on both sides and I'm using that clamp to hold it. That way when I cure it under the UV light, there's not one side of it that's laying down that's not getting cured and the whole entire thing is encapsulated because if I did one side and then did the other side, I'm still going to have, it's going to be very small and mostly not noticeable, but there is going to be a seam between the two. Doing it this way avoids that seam. So now that his paint is all dried, I'm going to very carefully pop him off of the globe finally after many hours of being stuck on there. And I did paint over his eyes. I don't, you might have noticed earlier, but that's very easy to scrape off because these eyes are glass. I can just take like my needle tool or my X-Acto knife or something like that and just scrape that layer of acrylic paint off. Acrylic paint is very kind of plasticky anyway, so it comes off very easily. I've never had any issues with it. Um, then I'm going to finally get to work on the underside of this guy. I'm going to just acrylic black paint most of the underside. Um, the belly, however, is going to be white, obviously. Here you go, white belly. And I did it this way because I wanted to make sure that there was good contrast. Typically the underbellies of snails and slugs and things are a lighter color. And so most of the time white is my go-to color. Um, it's also going to uh, make his little smile more pronounced once I get up to it. And very, just very carefully going around the edges. Um, obviously, if you mess up, there's ways to go back and fix it, but it's always better to just go slow and go carefully and, you know, make sure things are as clean as possible as you go. I'm going to kind of go up in between each of those segments a little bit, just so that you kind of get almost like a look that the belly is underneath the segments. And then I'm going to start working on figuring out my placement for the actual wings. Now the belly is dry at this point. That's why I'm touching it. <laughs> Though it would not be out of the question for me to just touch all over the bottom of it, forgetting that the paint was wet. I do that all the time. I'm going to use some super glue to attach it. Um, definitely read your super glue instructions and make sure you're using it safely and appropriately. I've used lots of different kinds of super glues. I kind of go back and forth. Loctite is my personal favorite. Um, but for this, this is what I had. So this is what I used and it was just fine. I'm mainly using this just to kind of tack it in place, just a very small amount, just to kind of hold it. And then I'm going to uh, put UV resin underneath as well to um, really cement it into place as well as to make sure, yeah, see, you can see how the glue like holds it, but it's not like hundred percent. And you can see also there where it touches the wing kind of cover. I'm going to also put a little dab of glue just to extra have that second anchoring point anywhere that things touch. It's always best to just, you know, go ahead and give them that extra grip and support in those places. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give him his antenna. So what I did was once again with my hand drill, I drilled a nice big fat hole in the back of his head. <laughs> I gave this poor snail, uh, you know, just a, just a little bit of minor brain surgery, nothing major. And I used my X-Acto knife to kind of widen it a bit more so that this um, wire will more easily fit down in it. And rather than having the two individual pieces, I'm going to have them both be combined with kind of a U at the bottom. Because once again, structural integrity will be much better if I do it this way, rather than having those two that can kind of loosely slip and slide if they do ever get knocked. Having them firmly attached makes that pretty much impossible. The, the only thing that can happen to them is they can get bent which, you know, bend them right back into place. They'll be just fine. So once I get my hole made, I'm going to check my fit, make sure that everything's how I want it. I'm going to kind of adjust things and make sure that I have the right amount of wire there at the bottom to fit down into that hole, but also the right amount of wire uh, extra to actually make the shape and everything of these jewel beetle antenna. And then with my super glue, I'm going to stick them down in there. And then once that is fully dried, I got his face. I miss his little face. Once that's fully dried, I'm going to trim my wire to the size that I want it to be. And, and then I'm going to just wait to see what I do next because I don't remember what step I did next. It could go many different ways. I probably painted them next. 
If I was smart, I would have painted them next. I might have put UV resin on them next. We'll see. No, 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 no. I'm totally wrong. I wrapped them. I wrapped them with a thin jewelry beading wire. No, I painted them black next. Okay. Well, I painted them black next. <laughs> I definitely wrapped them though. Okay. Anyway, painted them <laughs> with black acrylic paint. I'm such a mess. This is going to be, I hope, hopefully this video and me filming my kind of, um, voiceover in this way, uh, is going well. If it's not, I'm so sorry. While those are drying, I'm going to do some other touch up painting just to kind of make sure that everything is exactly the way I want it before I start sealing anything, because once it's sealed, it's game over. So I'm gonna go through, touch up these kind of purple areas, make sure that I put my little artist stamp on here. Because of the way he was placed, I couldn't actually stamp it in there. I mean, I probably could have and then stuck him on there, but it would've gotten misshapen and everything. So I just opted for painting it on afterwards, which is something I do sometimes and it's just fine. And of course I had to make it all rainbowy just like the rest of them. And now we're gonna start working on the stand. <laughs> so I have these molds for UV resin that are clear silicone molds. The clear is very important because I'm using UV resin. I do sometimes use epoxy resin, like two part epoxy resin for this kind of stuff. Um, but I pretty recently have gotten into doing that. So this was pre my epoxy resin days. Um, and I'm gonna use my same UV resin that I used for the wings in this little circular form that I have. I'm gonna pop as many bubbles as I can with the toothpick. And then, so once that's cured, then we have this. Now, there are still some bubbles in this, but it's fine in this instance. I don't worry too much about it uh, because, oh my gosh, I just got so behind myself. What I did there was I, <laughs> I scored the top of the layer of that rectangular piece to the shape I wanted. And then I took it outside with my Dremel and cut it into that shape to be more of a stand. And now here I'm kind of checking how he fits on it, but then I'm gonna have to ultimately adjust the angle of that so that he's up a little bit more. And then I'm going to attach it with more UV resin. What I was saying before was I don't mind many bubbles. So sometimes I will stress about really making sure that I get rid of them. Sometimes I won't. Um, but because this is like a snail and it's a slimy thing and here comes my dog down the stairs that you can probably hear. Um, because it's a slimy thing, I don't worry too much about air bubbles unless it's like a structural problem. So I've got some new UV resin now that I'm adding some glitters to that that's going to be his slime. So now that's going to get applied with a toothpick all on his kind of underbelly and mouth area, as well as his underside. And then that's gonna get cured. And um, I, I did cure the kind of like mouth upper part a little bit before I did the full belly, because if I held him like this while that mouth area was still wet, it would just run down the side of him. So curing in stages is, is kind of important. So check the fit once again. You can see here where I've kind of, <laughs> kind of, this is going so fast now. We went from going really slow to going really fast. I've kind of um, reshaped that to better fit so that he's at the angle that I want. Dipped that in the UV resin, stuck it to the bottom, uh, put him under the UV light once again, just so that that was like grabbing him. And then now I'm gonna start just layering the glittery UV resin onto the stand as well. I just wiped that with my finger. I shouldn't have done that. You should wear gloves when you do this and you should not touch UV resin with your fingers. Uh, so my apologies for my lack of safety here. Um, I maybe should also be using a respirator. I definitely use a respirator when I do the two-part epoxy resin because that stuff is stanky. Um, but a lot of the times this UV resin is very low odor and so it's probably, maybe, I think it's maybe okay for me not to use a respirator. Um, but you know. So anyway, and then I do this technique in order to make drips where I scoop just a little glob of UV resin onto a toothpick and very carefully and very tediously hold that in front of the UV light and kind of spin it in order to control the rate at which it drips to try and get it to drip at just the right moment that it's about to cure so that I get the actual drip solidified. And then I can take a little bit more UV resin on the top, like end of that after I detach it from the toothpick to then stick it up onto the snail so that it looks drippy and like it's oozing. The snail is just a waterfall of, <laughs> of slime. 
but I, I've done in the past where I just do like a clean like circle and circle and support base and that's fine but I would like to try and make it incorporated into the sculpture a little bit more make the stand a little bit more sculptural when I can so I went with doing it this way so now that he's nice and supported now I'm gonna go back to his antenna that was probably really loud I'm sorry with some very thin jewelry beading wire this stuff is super thin definitely not a great thing for like structural support unless you're like trying to essentially tie two bigger pieces of wire together. And I just wrapped it around the antenna, making sure that I get my little ends pinched under so that they're not sticking out and being all pokey and annoying. Um, and then I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side as well, just because I felt like this was the closest I could get to kind of a segmented antenna look. Um, and leaving them just smooth was just it just i don't know it just seemed a little too lackluster so i opted to wrap them with this beading wire in this way now after i've got that done i'm going to take some uv resin and just put a little daub back here where the antenna go into the head and this will do a couple of things it will again be an extra anchoring for those antenna into his head and it will also allow me to have kind of a, a more smoothed out transition between the antenna and the head so that when I go back and paint and kind of cover that up, it'll be a little bit nicer looking than if I just left the antenna sticking in the clay where I had kind of roughly cut it up with my um, hand drill and my X-Acto knife and all that. So once that's all cured, now I'm going back over and painting it, making sure that those wires are covered in black, and then repainting the back of the head to kind of cover that transitional area as well. This little happy face. Make sure it looks nice from every angle, constantly checking every angle of the sculpture, making sure that there's nothing I've missed, making sure that it looks good from every possible angle and viewpoint that I can. Because even though I know that these snails are something that's going to most likely sit on a shelf or a table or, or something like that and be looked at primarily from one direction, I do want to make sure that it looks nice from every direction. If you pick it up, if you look at it, if someone's checking it out and taking a look at it, you know, that it looks nice from every angle. The um, next thing that I'm going to do, which is like maybe almost the last step, is because I want this guy to have a really high gloss finish because of the nature of his kind of iridescence, I'm going to coat the whole entire thing in UV resin. So that's what I'm doing here. I have this little fan brush, which is another MVP. This, this, this fan brush is my resin MVP for sure. I still have it and I still use it, though again, it's gonna have to be replaced soon. Um, but I'm gonna just work from kind of the lower part, like the, the bottom end of the sculpture as far as where things are layered and work my way up. So I'm gonna start with the body, which is kind of the underneath, and then I'm gonna do the wings and then I'm gonna do that kind of neck collar area and move my way up in that way. That way I can kind of do them in chunks and do them in stages and then cure them. And this will also help to avoid um, those kind of seams that I was talking about before where if you have the two if you like do a section and cure it and then do another another section and cure it you're still gonna have that kind of seam area in between where the two touch whereas if you can do the biggest chunk of it all in one go and then have the next area all in one go and hide as many of those seams as possible then it just I don't know it just looks nicer so I did that and then it's going to get cured under the light, which I should be wearing gloves while I'm doing this because that UV light is bad for your skin, especially as much as my left hand in particular um, time is spent under that light. I, I've started wearing gloves when I, when I do this because I'm starting to get paranoid about it. Um, and so next I'm doing the wings, making sure that those are once again, even though they've been coated, I'm gonna re-coat them just to make sure that everything is stuck together. And I'm gonna do the underside of the wings now, like I said earlier, uh, at the same point in time, that way I don't have that seam in between and that way that wing is like firmly attached. Not only does it now have the super glue attaching it, but it now also has that UV resin attaching it as well. So it is grabbed onto there. I'm gonna do the top part of the wings as well and this glossy UV resin just really makes this powder pigment pop man like it was popping before but this gloss just really really brings it home so I'm doing all of the wings I I might have done like one side and then cured it and then done the other side 
but I'm not totally sure. And then after that, it is pretty much finished. Once everything is totally cured, totally done, I can take it over the light box and I can take my nice pictures, as nice as I can reasonably do at this point in time. I'm not the best photographer. That's another skill I really gotta work on. But uh, yeah, here he is. I really love how he turned out. I think he's really pretty. I love the colors. I love his little face. I think that the stand turned out pretty good. I'm a sucker for any time that I can make little drippies. I love making little drippies. It's super fun. Um, but yeah, so hopefully you guys liked the snail and enjoyed the journey that I went on to make it, even though it was maybe a little long. Um, definitely thank you so much for watching this video and for having an interest in my art and in these weird strange snails that I make. <laughs> I am constantly blown away by the amount of support and interest that I get on all my social media. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you have any comments, any ideas, any thoughts about what you'd like to see me do in the future, what kinds of videos you'd like to see me make, definitely leave them below. I am always happy to answer questions, always happy to, happy to show you whatever you might be interested in seeing. So um, yeah, just thank you so much. And don't forget, you're awesome. And I'll see you in probably like five more months after I make another video finally. Now hopefully it'll be sooner than that. Thank you guys. Have a great rest of your day. You're awesome.